Hello, hello, hello. How you doing? Welcome to it. This is another episode of The Takedown with me, your boy Q Dube, and we've got a very dope one today. We've got uh, Linda Masarira, who's going to be chatting to us in a bit. But before we get into that, you know how we do. We always start off with a couple of stories of what's been happening in the week around our beautiful country of Zimbabwe. So let's get into it in three, in two, in one, in go. <laughs> So today we're just going to give you two stories and all of them are going to uh, are about women because we're celebrating the Women's Month. The first one that we're going to give you is from the former Vice President Joyce Mujuru who says that her political days are now behind her. Now, uh, speaking after a meeting with the First Lady on Monday, the former VP said, I am not into politics anymore. She had a meeting with the First Lady where they discussed a whole host of things and she said in a statement, what made me happy is that we spoke about women's issues considering that we are both in the Women's Month and did not discuss positions or politics. The First Lady is apolitical, so we discuss family issues, health and the way we live. Amai Munangago sought to catch up with me and my family and the farming business I am in. I have extended an invitation to Amai to come and see for herself. Mai Mujuru also offered herself for ambassadorial duties. So she said that she will be able to do as long as they have nothing to do with politics. So she said, I will support you and you can send me anywhere, Amai, when it comes to issues involving women empowerment and family family unity so that is super dope we are happy for her we are uh, excited that she has taken her retirement and is going to focus on things um that are a bit more personal to her uh which is obviously family and you know farming you know um obviously now that there's a space that needs to be filled in the vice president position a lot of people were hoping that they would see a female uh, vice president come back as she uh, is the first ever female vice president that we had in the country so you know people were hoping for that so I, I, I suspect you know in the back of people's minds they thought that um, she would she would then you know hey do you want to come back and take up your position she was like mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, please 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 <laughs> Our second story is a bit of a sad one. Um, uh, news has just broken to us and the team that a very popular actress in Zimbabwe by the name of Anna Nira has passed on. She was 38. She passed on, on after succumbing to injuries sustained during a robbery in South Africa, Bedford View uh, on Monday evening. She is an actress that came to fame on the popular TV drama, the first ever soapy that was had in Zimbabwe, which is Studio 263. Um, she was just a phenomenal actress, uh, someone that, uh, I mean, this came at a time when we never knew that, you know, we could produce uh, shows of that quality or of that concept and have um actresses uh, and actors one that looked good uh but two that were very talented um obviously after you know she was now based in south africa for the most part and um we here at magamba tv and zimbabwe at large extend our condolences to her family her friends and her fans and we say rest easy queen and we will see you up again Hello, hello, and welcome back to the show. Thank you for staying with us and watching. Now, like we said, we've got um, the, the write-up that we had. Uh, we, we, you are the only female president in the country, yeah? Yes, I am. And her situation. We've got uh, Linda T. Masarira. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Q, for inviting me to your show. I'm hoping to have an interesting conversation with you and all those who are following this conversation. No, it's it's going to be pretty good. It's going to be good. Now, you know, we we uh, we mentioned Togozani Kupe in your intro. Uh, we have a bit of history together, and um, like we noticed, I asked you this question that on your Wikipedia page, it still refers to you as. Spokesperson for the MDCT. 
Okay. Uh, what is happening is I only realized as well um, in December that my Wikipedia wasn't updated. And since I wasn't mm-hmm. the one who actually uploaded the information on Wikipedia, I had to look for people who were well versed with how to go about it. And I found one mm-hmm. last week. And I, I must say that my Wikipedia page is being updated to my current status and current achievements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm hoping that by the end of this week, my Wikipedia will be updated and all other profiles of uh, Linda T. Masarira that are on social media will be updated accordingly. Mm-hmm. Ah, got you. Wait, how much were you charged? Someone once offered me to open a Wikipedia page for me and they charged me 500 bucks. I was like, you know what? It's it's fine. If anyone wants to know anything about me, they can call me. I'll tell them. They charged me 500. <laughs> Apparently, I, I, I didn't. I, I don't know who did my Wikipedia page. And the guy who, uh, mm. to, uh, who actually have the offer to edit my Wikipedia page, uh, just charge me data fees, data collection fees, because it's someone I know, so I'm actually going to be paying them about um, 50 US dollars for that. It makes, oh man, like, I, I hope I can, you give me, you give me the connect so that I can use them for no 500 bucks for someone to read something they can know about. <laughs> I, now. I will definitely do that after this show. Nah, let's let's we should we should get it going. So, um, one of your recent tweets, right, reads, uh, "I am a hundred percent in support of the patriotic bill. I pray that it passes into law in Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe is not due for export. We can't trade our sovereignty to get fund from neoliberal countries. Who, who is trading our sovereignty, or who is planning to?" Actually, we all know what has been happening in our political economy um, the past Mm. 20 years. We know that we've had the main opposition, the MDC, that was using any force to ensure that they get into power. But at the end of the day, in as much as we want to assert power, to get power through democratic means or through the electoral processes, we also have to consider the livelihoods of the people of Zimbabwe. It is unfortunate that at some point in my life before I I started trying to understand what these sanctions are all about, I I was in support of all these sanctions because I didn't know how detrimental they were to people's livelihoods, including myself. So it is unfortunate that sometimes we seek the advice of embassies and spend most of our time running to embassies, myself included, because I I was once in, 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 in that trajectory trying to sell out our country, our sovereignty, trying to get them on board. But what we don't realize when we're doing that is that we are actually advancing the neo-colonialist agenda against advancing the black consciousness agenda where African nations are supposed to lead themselves without due influence from the West or the East. So for me, having walked that path and knowing how the Western embassies work in Kahoots, with most opposition parties in Zimbabwe, minors, labor economists, and African Democrats, the party that I lead, because we've got clarity on what we want to achieve and what we want to do. And what we're basically saying is, if you are going to attain power by going to beg for sanctions or pushing for sanctions on your country, you're definitely being unpatriotic because at the end of the day, when Zimbabwe cannot trade, it is going to affect the economy. Once the economy is affected, every Zimbabwean is affected. This habit of wanting to garner mm-hmm. protest votes against development doesn't work anymore. We have tried that for the past 20 years and it failed. When one trajectory fails, any logical person will try to look for plan B. What is plan B? And for me and the team that helped me form Labour Economists and African Democrats, we said, Iyaba Nava is a point. As a child, let's join forces and try and come up with an ideology that works in the Zimbabwean and African context, an ideology that is pro-development, an ideology that is pro-people, an ideology that will benefit every Zimbabwean, regardless of class society, regardless of tribe, regardless of gender, regardless of where you are coming from. That is basically the whole idea of how we formed labor economists and African Democrats. And we still continue to say we should not at any time try to get power by selling our sovereignty because there is no free lunch in politics. 
There is no free lunch. Anyone who comes to help you is not coming to help you for nothing. They want something back in return. And it's unfortunate that both the MDC and the ZANU PF are being used by neo-colonialists and they don't understand that. ZANU is being used by the Chinese and the Russians. The MDCs are used by the Americans and the British and other nationalities. But at the end of the day, if we want to fix the crisis in Zimbabwe, we have to get to a stage where we put our heads together and say, okay, we all have our different political jackets, but today let's not talk about our political ideologies. Let's start discussing a way forward that works for the people of Zimbabwe. But how different are these ones that the MDC went and garnered for from uh, the sanctions that came, that the targeted sanctions that came before? The, you mean the difference between the, the sanctions that the MDC pushed for and the sanctions that the Smith mm -hmm. regime had? Is that your question? Not, yeah, you, well, fine, even even the Smith regime, but Okay, basically, my understanding is um, you have been sold a dummy. You have always been told that these okay. sanctions are targeted. But for me, there is nothing targeted about these sanctions because we see the adverse effect of sanctions on the bubble. Zimbabwe is not the only country that is on sanctions. We also have Cuba, Venezuela. Look at the status of their citizens there. That is what sanctions do to nations. They, they, they run down the economy. They make people desperate. There'll be no money at the end of the day. The economy is in tatters. And it does not save the interests of any ordinary person. But yes, people have been running to the... You okay. Carry on. Okay. What I wanted to say is, is that um, we have always we have we have seen a list of people who are said to be on sanctions, but if you look at their lifestyles and the way they go about their business every day, does that, in your own view, look like a person who's on sanctions or people on sanctions? They live lavish lifestyles. They're running most of the companies and running the economy. So at the end of the day. We need to review what effect those sanctions have had because those sanctions right. have had no effect at all on the targeted people because they naturally breed corruption. And when they breed corruption... Right, so then, therefore, haven't you answered yourself, though? Pardon? <laughs> haven't you answered yourself? It, then the problem is not sanctions, it's, it's the leaders or the people that are put in power because one of the things that you mentioned um, the sanctions uh, we had no money just last year 60 million US dollars that was meant for COVID disappeared under the um, uh, Minister of Health at the time but did you get what I'm saying so it's it's to me it's like I didn't you just get said you it you're breaking up. Is not... I didn't get you can you repeat what you said you're breaking up I was breaking. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So I'm saying that in a way, you just stated that the issue is more from the politicians themselves rather than the sanctions, right? So, you know, when we say, you said in your statement that a country under sanctions, you know, they run out of money, but then in the same sentence, the politicians, are living lavish lifestyles. So is the sanctions really the problem or it's the people in power that are the problem? Because if, if the country is not happening because of sanctions, how do these guys uh, maintain these lifestyles? Should we all be going down the same rabbit hole? That's exactly what I was saying, that at the end of the day, we have had, let me give you an example. Kudam Sasi was not a politician. He's not on the list of um, targeted sanctions. But there was a point when he actually made noise about failing to trade and he was being told that Zimbabwe is on sanctions. He's not the only person. There are several mm -hmm. people who have failed to, to have their business transactions because Zimbabwe is on, is on sanctions. When we get to the point where businesses are failing to transact or trade with other businesses in other countries because Zimbabwe is in sanctions, then it means that these sanctions are not only targeted individuals. That is the point I wanted to raise. 
And it is not just small businesses that are failing to transact. We even have mining companies that are failing even to get equipment and machinery that they want for their mines because they are told that Zimbabwe in courts is on sanctions. We have had Zimbabwean banks. We have had most farmers failing to, to, to send some of their produce for export to other countries because they're told we cannot buy from Zimbabwe. I've got a friend who went for a seminar in Germany and she was supposed to get her allowances transferred into a Zimbabwean bank account. But because the bank account was ZB, they said we cannot send money into that account because Zimbabwe is on sanctions and the, and the bank as well is on sanctions. So we need to interrogate the sanctions issue thoroughly and see if it serves the interests of business per se in Zimbabwe. Because those that are said to have been targeted seem to have been missed. That's basically what I was saying, right. or what you did not understand. That's, that's what you're saying. No, I think here there's a, what you're saying is there's a little contradiction in what you, you said in your statement before that most of the, most of the businesses, do you get what I'm saying? Exactly. So if they own yes. most of the businesses, and they've put their nephews, nieces, or children to run these businesses. They run the big company. When it's time for them to try and trade, they trace back who you are and who you're linked to. They are going to say, "Nah, we we can't we can't allow trade." It then goes back to do do, do you get what I'm saying? Because even the time of Smith, we understand that uh, Zim was on heavy sanctions, but there was a rise in production at that time. And um, I think we're also realizing that this farming season, we are going to produce a lot because I think if you remember, early last year, I wrote the white paper on sanction busting measures, which I've realized that the mm -hmm. government of Zimbabwe actually picked up a number of issues and a number of recommendations that we'd put in there. Because one of the things that we had raised is for us to be able to bust these sanctions is we have to produce on large scale and ensure that Zimbabwe is food secure. Because most of the revolutions worldwide have been centered around food. And as long as we are producing, we'll be able to process and reopen our industries and to be able to also acquire what we need to start the innovative and technology industries in Zimbabwe. But as long as we are not producing, we are not able to pass sanctions. And I think that is why the current government actually came up with the proposal concept. And I, I have seen that there are a lot of command agriculture, command horticulture, command uh, animal husbandry that has been going on. And I want to tell you the truth, right. uh, Zim agriculture is rising, and it is a positive, and it will right. actually turn around the economy by mid-2021 and we're going to 2022. And I, I would like to applaud myself, and yes, I have to, because we came up with these ideas. And I know ZANU PF will right. never come out and open and say, we stole this from, uh, or we borrowed this from uh, Linda Masarira's sanction busting pages, white paper. They'll never come out. But I know that, and I actually clap hands for myself and say, I did this, and at least it's something productive for the people of Zimbabwe. Right, right. No, don't worry about getting that credit. You'll you'll become president one day, and then you'll also get your chance to you know, to to loot a bit and and you know thank yourself. You'll get the chance to thank yourself. Do you do you do you do you see that? <laughs> do you see that? Do you see that happening though? What's the likelihood oh, yes, of you ever becoming president? And how long do you think realistically? How long do you take? Uh, realistically, I think in uh, 2028, I will be the first female president of Zimbabwe. 2023 has got a lot of political dynamics in place. And for me, I'm going to take 2023 as a, as a lesson. I'm going to get into it to understand the ropes. Because you just cannot jump into it and expect to get into it just because you've dived into a pool. We all have to learn. We all have to take the baby steps. And we all have to learn to know how to do things. So for me, I don't see myself getting into power into 2023 because of the political dynamics in our political space. But I'm taking that opportunity to learn, to understand, and perfect my campaign going forward and making sure that in 2028, I'll be sitting in Munumutapa building right there in Samura Marshall Avenue in Harare. Oh, okay. All right. Can I, can I just, like, can I have a job in mining? Like, can I be... 
somewhere in mining, like, can I be the head of ZMDC or something when you become president? As long as you've got the credentials and the meritocracy, there's no problem because I ain't going to be taking people just because I know them into, into government or into <laughs> any part of state. I'm clear about that. <laughs> Don't be like this. Like, don't do this. Like, I, I know before your um, before your activism days, you 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 worked at the NRZ. Tell oh, us yes. about that. How was that? It was an eye opener for me, and it showed me that I had a lot of work to do to turn around, mm -hmm. especially the, the the labor aspect of Zimbabwe. Workers are still viewed right. as second class citizens, they viewed as pawns, they are underpaid, there's a lot of labor injustice at the workplace, women are viewed as, uh, as, as doormats. And my time at NRZ was a constant battle and struggle with the management, struggle for salaries, struggle for labor justice, struggle for, for just the labor act to be adhered to. And I realized that a lot of people think that going to work is a favor or they are so fortunate that they are working that they are now their rights to be trampled upon and they're so afraid to speak out. And at times I'll be the only person who was speaking out and I always had riot police following me every time I try to get to the general manager's office. I was. But the highlight of my time at NRZ was that I was able to reorganize protests which had happened 10 years or 12 years before I joined NRZ because what happened naturally was the Robert Mugabe regime had militarized the NRZ because it was the biggest employer in Zimbabwe and most of the protests and most of the politicians actually came from NRZ, if you know that, mm -hmm. from, the labor, from the labor union. And um, ZCTU was a baby of SARU, Zimbabwe Amalgated Railway Workers Union. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of political right. activism that also happens within the NRZ. So there was a clamp down and most of the offices were held by ex-military men, retired military men. But I was not taken aback. And I remember at one time, the late Eko Modoka Rakatai had the audacity to put a gun on his table in his office to say, ah, it's also quite a better I can fight a if I'm a if I'm a giddy. You know, he was like actually boasting about not paying us and all that. But that did not stop me. I kept on fighting, fighting for labor justice. I'm one person who can go out of my way to say I'm going to do this for myself and all the people who are being unjustly treated. And I think mm -hmm. you know that I eventually got fired in uh, 2016 by the Zuba judgment. Right. And I was the mm -hmm. only female who was fired during that um, time from the first page that I was fired. I was the only female who was fired. I actually challenged that in court to win the case that I was... Right. I was supposed to be reelected, and I refused and said, I think it's time up. I need to do something at a higher level. I have to be able to influence policy, to change all these labor injustices, etc. And you'll be shocked to learn that if you if you look backwards on the chronicle of uh, the 1st of August, 2016, mm. the headline on the front page was NRZ fires the militant and radical. And they were referring to me because I just used to tell them that can I talk that pain, talk that pain. And I can right. do the whole railway operations by myself. That's just who I am when I want mm -hmm. to be visible. I'm fighting for the cause. I'm one person who can sacrifice for a cause. I got fired for the people of NRZ to get their salaries. I kept on influencing labor, even from outside the NRZ. And I still keep on fighting for them to have decent salaries that are paid on time so that they can also have time. I just advocate for NRZ, mm -hmm. I advocate for all workers in Zimbabwe to be paid decent wages because workers should be respected. As long as workers are earning paltry salaries, there is no way that we'll be able to develop them. When workers are underpaid, they will end up looking for other sources to ensure that they sustain their livelihood. So it is important for every worker to have a decent salary. And our government has to ensure that they pay the poverty that line wage to almost everyone in the government sector, in the public sector. And all private companies should also thrive to pay decent salaries to their workers. That is part of my advocacy work and that is part of the labor that is in labor 
labor economists and African Democrats. We're also fighting for pensioners because generally pensioners are suffering. Just last week, someone was telling me that they're getting an equivalent of about 12 US dollars every month. Who can, who can survive on 12 US dollars realistically? So these are the struggles to continue to fight. I'm passionate about people's livelihoods. And I want every Zimbabwean to just have a sustained livelihood because I don't believe that there's any Zimbabwean who's supposed to be poor considering the vast mineral resources that we have and the arable land that we have. Every Zimbabwean is just supposed to live a life that is free from fear or what. I, 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 I hear you. I hear you. The NRZ's motto uh, is moving the nation forward. Uh, do you think right now in its current state uh, is the National Railway Company doing just that? And if you were to take over the, 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 the NRZ, what, what's, what's the first two things you'd fix? The first two things that I'll do is I'll rehabilitate the rail network. It is particularly uh -huh. important to do that. The rail network hasn't been fixed in more than 15 years, more than 20, if I'm not wrong. I would ensure that we restructure the labor force at NRZ and also ensure that we rehabilitate the NRZ training center. If you would like to know, the NRZ training center was the biggest rail training center in Africa. Most countries used to send their trained drivers, guard specials, commercial workers to be trained here in Bulawayo. But all that is um, no longer functional. So it is important to rehabilitate the rail network and to ensure that we get all the bulk traffic off the roads so that our roads <laughs> will not right, have right. roads because they're no longer port right. roads that we have. Because um, right. I think that is what is very important. I think um, why the NRZ is failing to move the nation right now is because there are too many military people who don't understand the rail, the rail business. The rail transport business is a complex business which needs someone who's got hands-on experience of how to run the rail business. It is unfortunate that because of um, the patronage system that we have in Zimbabwe, we end up putting mafese, numu, jigaro, and jinjimbo. And they run down those things because they don't understand. I used to say this, uh, there's a time when um, Tarakadzai was still GM. They started having this uh, graduate trainee program. And they'll bring graduates from UZ. A graduate from UZ can turn around nothing at the railways because the railways has <laughs> got its own unique system. That is why since time immemorial, it had its own training center on courses and certification programs which are not available at any university under the sun. And that is the reality. Mm -hmm. And if the president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, is serious about rehabilitating the NRZ, they should seriously consider taking former NRZ workers to be part of the NRZ board, to be part of the executive at the NRZ so that they can turn around things. Way back in time, during the, 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 the 80s and during the Smith regime, no one would become the general manager of the NRZ without having worked in almost every department in the railways. You just cannot appoint a person with an MBA to go and run the railways. What do they know about the railways? What do they know about rolling stock? What do they know about the commercial aspect of the business? What do they know about um, carriage and wagon? I remember in 20... 2008, the late Air Commodore went with some military retired guys to China to buy wagons and locomotives, and they bought the wrong things because they don't know about it. <laughs> they did not even have the audacity to take people who actually know the job and the specifications of what needed to be bought. So mm -hmm. if our government and the Ministry of Transport is sincere about making sure that the NRZ gets back on its knees. Mm. They have to reconsider the type of people they are getting into the board, into the executive position and management positions within the NRZ. Okay, okay. You mentioned uh, His Excellency the President. You uh, will be running against him in 2023 and you said obviously more seriously later on. But what, what five things would you say he's doing right currently? I think um, what he has done right, firstly, is um, he has allowed political actors to, to, to dialogue. He has allowed multi-party democracy to exist, to thrive. 
Secondly, I think he has supported agriculture, which was very important and critical, especially at the juncture that we were at economically. Thirdly, I think he is trying to support the small scale miners to be able to mine. I think since the second dispensation came into power, they, we haven't gotten news of Makorogoza, um, Ashuro, or Wache displaced, except that time when we started having the Bashurubis and whatever, which I still think was politically motivated. Fourthly, I think he has, he has also tried to depolarize Danupia from within. We no longer see the vileness or the level of violence that we used to see during the, the Mugabe regime. I remember during the Mugabe regime, you just could not speak the word Mugabe. You had to have bowls of steel just to utter the word Mugabe because there were always guys looking and hanging over, whether Pama shops, Kupi, and whatever. But we have seen a laxity in our environments where people can now speak openly about what's happening um, in our country. And lastly, I think um, he is trying to, to, to keep corruption, though the factionalism aspect within ZANU PF seems to be the hindering factor for corruption to be kept from within ZANU PF mm -hmm. and government. I think those are the five things that I've been observing from the HE. Okay, okay. And, and how is your led party different from any of the uh, current existing political parties? Um, lead is um, lead is hundred percent organically homegrown. We do not get funding from the west or the east. We fund ourselves through our membership fees. We've got a business unit that is responsible for creating wealth for the party. We are the only party in Zimbabwe that is gender balanced. The only party in Zimbabwe that does not have a women's league or a women's assembly or a women's council because we do not believe in marginalizing or discriminating women from governance positions. Right. The other thing that LEAD is doing is we're grooming and nurturing young leaders because young people have been used for political bickering and political grandstanding over the years. Dancing right. at rallies, mobilizing people, and in some cases involved in violence. But in lead, we are teaching them that you are the leader that you've been waiting for. It is time for you to lead. We are teaching them to transform communities. We are teaching them to be able to create wealth and not just to wait to look for a job. We are grooming leaders from the grassroots and teaching people that you have to vote for a leader that you know, that you've interacted with, who has been involved in community projects in your area. We are trying to push the development and devolution agenda to ensure that we depolarize communities and decolonize mindsets. We want a new mm. person, a new man with a different way of thinking. That is why you find that most of our shadow councillors are young people residing in their wards who are known there, who have started working in their wards so that people get to know about them. We are a party that mm. is not promising people things, but that is actually doing things with the little that we have so that we show you that if we ever get into power, we will be able to do more. We are just not a party of press conferences or a party that just teaches things and promises people things. We are actually doing things slowly but surely as we learn how to interact with the grassroots and to ensure that lead becomes a household brand. Okay, okay. What, what, what opportunities do you... First, um, we need the technical team to get ready because we're going to do... We've got a... a pick your, uh, a segment that we have called explain this pick so we're going to show you a pick and then you tell us what was happening at that point so as they get ready what what opportunities are there for the taking right now right now when you're talking to a young zimbabwean who's saying i, I don't know what to do in this country what would you say i woke up but there's this there's that and the other what can what opportunities are there for the young people in zim to take Right now, the biggest opportunity that is there for young people in Zimbabwe is farming, body culture, mm. animal husbandry. You know two ways about it. 
People always mm-hmm. buy food. You will never go wrong by producing food. And that is the advice that I'm giving everyone. Even for a person who is saying I'm being underpaid at my workplace, I keep on giving them the advice that unekumusha kuna sabuku. And I don't know if you have a sabuku. Upiwe kwa ani hectare, two hectares kako. Find something to do on the side. And the best way to go forward is food. You will never go wrong with producing food. Okay, so you you think that's the that's the only part. If all of us become farmers, then no, you said one thing. We can't all be farmers uh-huh. exactly, but yeah. we've got plenty of land, and we have to utilize what we've got. Secondly, I've spoke a lot about special economic zones, identifying special economic zones, opportunities in there, and making sure that you make money out of what you have realized in that specific special economic zone in your community. I'm a, okay. I'm a huge fan of arts, and I still believe that uh, people in arts, in music, and in sports are still being um, underprivileged in Zimbabwe. And I'm still working with uh, various development partners to see on how we can promote our art, music, and sporting personalities to have, you know, just enough to sustain them, like what happens in other countries. It's sad that yeah. people like Soldier Love it, die in a desperate situation. We've got footballers who are living in abject poverty. We've got artists, skilled artists who cannot even buy themselves a loaf of bread. It pains me so much. And I'm still looking at ways on how to ensure that we empower these young people, uh, how we stop piracy, how we get to promote what they're doing so that it can also sustain their livelihoods. Right, right. It is that is that um would would I sense maybe disappointment in how the current minister of um sports arts and culture has been manning that fort? Yes, I'm very disappointed and I think I raised this issue on my various tweets on Twitter directed at her and unfortunately she doesn't respond. But we will not stop engaging. I, I will try and go and pay her the visit so that I can actually air my grievances with her because we're killing right. a lot of talent in Zimbabwe, especially in sport. We are killing a lot of right. talent. I'm still very disgruntled by the way the, the Castle um, Premier League hasn't commenced as yet and how we as Zimbabweans do not support our own football. We have to learn to support our own things for them to, mm. to, to be able to nature the talent that we have. But EPL, I stopped watching EPL two years ago. When I want right. to watch football, I watch local football and I'll support local football. I will not go and buy a jersey of Arsenal. I'd rather buy a Tibari jersey. I want to support sports in Zimbabwe. This is advice that I'm giving to other Zimbabweans. Let's start okay. supporting our own local teams. Let's support our musicians. Let's support our artists. That is the only way that these young people will be able to grow and perfect whatever they're doing. And businesses should also invest in our own sports so that our, our, our football teams can have their own stadiums, their own gymnasiums, and they can be able to sustain themselves without having to run to look for donors or to go for months without salaries. I think this is a conversation right. that we seriously need to have with Zimbabweans, that we need to support each other in Zimbabweans before we start spending time buying jerseys for, of EPL teams. Yet we've got teams here in Zimbabwe that are struggling with. No, no, I hear you. That's a very good point. Um, I will ask for future reference that we, we never liken uh, uh, Arsenal and Dimbare. Uh, no, as, we, we, we can't do that. Uh, Arsenal is, is way, way more superior to, to Dimbare. Um, if you had likened it to Highlanders, I would have said, oh, okay, yeah, I can see. I mean, you know, yes. Oh, that's, that's, just, that's just me getting, getting that one. <laughs> <laughs> No, I get you, but I'm saying that because I, I used to be an avid uh, Arsenal supporter before I stopped supporting any you stopped. foreign come team. Back. Come I back. now just do local. For me, local... Yeah. No, local is lekker. I support... Who do you support locally? 100% Zimbabwean. Pardon? Which, 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 food, which team do you support locally? Dynamos FC, Chazunguza. Ah. <laughs> You know what I think? I think we can but end the interview worry. right here. Don't worry. Wait, let, let me tell you something. Don't worry. Ah. Uh, 
but my team B is Boso because my husband supports Boso. So when 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 things start happening, well, they have to go and watch Boso and Ateti, you know. So I, I have to learn to support him. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, no. When you say that, then when you say that, then we are we are we are uh, we are we are kind of together. Now, I hope the technical team is ready. We're going to show you three pictures, and then you let us know what was happening at that period. Oh. So here's the first picture. If they can upload it. Oh, okay. On that picture, what was going on? Here? I was. At... <laughs> let me tell you what happened. That day, oh. I was. Doing whatever I was doing, I had no plan of going anywhere. Then I just got a call from one of my friends and said, But my sanctions are I need. But you're sure my sanctions are I need. I do anti sanctions, but I had no plan to go to the to the anti sanctions. But I think you can also see by the way I was dressed. I was just <laughs> going about my business. And when I got there, I was just going to match and I wasn't going inside the stadium. And then I bumped into Louis Matutu, my comrade. And he said, ah, why, 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 what you think, what you think? And that is exactly what happened. On that picture, <laughs> that's just my side of the story and what I feel about sanctions. <laughs> and, you know, oh, as man. usual, journalists will try and look for that shot, that awkward shot that will go viral. <laughs> right, but right. at the end of the day, there's no bad publicity in politics. Anyway. But no, I love there isn't. You know, like, <laughs> as you explain it, as you explain it, that you can actually see in that picture that you had no plans to be there. Like you, your, your explanation makes all the sense in the world. Exactly. <laughs> all right, let's go to the second picture. <laughs> you can say that again. What was happening there? <laughs> what was happening there is. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 I got you. I got you, huh? I got you. One of that funny day, I was, I was at my ex husband. Yeah, you really got me there. I was at my ex husband's um, homestead in Madura, and um, I think it was a couple of days after a funeral. And because the, 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 the space was very strong, I mean, there were a lot of people who were now challenging why there was an MVP person there. So I left to the Zambia and my ex husband was actually teasing me. I have another thing I've done here. I don't see a photo of the other person. Don't know what I'm doing. I don't see it. I was not a good guy. I was just kidding around. And I don't know who actually kept it. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. They took that picture and exposed it, man. And all right, do we have the last one? Is the last one ready? Can you see this one? Yes. Is, is it the same period from the, the other one that you just explained? I explained that during the funeral. Um, oh, so it's the same time. They, they were uncomfortable with having a person from, from the opposition in their area. And, you know, you, you can't run away from who you are at times, but sometimes when who you are ends up compromising family, you just have to do what you have to do when you're wrong. When you're wrong, you do what you want to do. No way that I was going to use the family vulnerable. I just said to get that, 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 that to Zambia and do whatever was happening to me. Not to say that I'm a family chef member. I know a lot of people are excused why I was actually there in the family chef. I was not 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 there in the what I've always said about that picture is I was trying to protect family. That way, mm. it would be very responsible with my end of the Musa in a Zamitia stronghold. What I could have about Tower of Shaka, you were sister in Tetiako, you could compromise family in Wata. There's a number of cases where you're going to Musa, what people are sister supposed to be MVP, and you can also have a good piece of our Musa very homeless. It's not what it is in the city. In a Pamata, you know, one of the things that I'm right. And I've said to people who continue raising this question, this but what I'm seeing today, and I've asked, what is in a piece of cloth? What is in a piece of cloth? Mm -hmm. Nothing. I've never seen a Zanu PF member. I don't even have a Zanu PF card. I don't do any Zanu PF business. But you can record whatever you want to record, it, but it will never change who I am. And that's the last picture that you actually could do. I'm the one who posted it. 
I myself on my status and those who thought they could set me score political points actually downloaded it for my status. If there was something to hide, I would have had to put it on my status to say. So basically, I think I, I, I ended up taking that picture to use it for my depolarization agenda and campaign to say, Akuna kuna asina hama ino sapoto za nukiyo. And that's the reality. So it's like she, and it's in Holia than the office that we have of the opposition people. No fama hukuera. Because when we look at people in parliament, who parliament says, they keep dying together, laugh together, whatever in this is, the animation is making. The enemy comes to the water because the leaders breed a culture of enemy, which is not there. If we can tolerate each other in our families, in our families, why can't we tolerate each other with our different political ideology? That is my view. We are not enemies. Even today, as the president of Labour, Economic and African Democrats, I still wear my MDP t-shirt and you kumba. You know, I'm going to have something that I take. But it does not mean that I'm still part of MDP. There is nothing in a piece of cloth. What I stand for is in my heart and my mind. Where I put my ex is my secret and I put it the day I go to the panel. But as of now, my ex is, my ex is for lead. My ex is right. my for lead and nothing else. Whether you, you, that picture is going to be posted a million times before 2023 elections, I will still say the same things. I will not done it, I've never been done it, and will never be done it. Thank you. Ah, got you, got you. All right, we've got, um, just to let you go, we won't keep you, we've got uh, rapid fire. This is just the first thing that comes to mind, or you just answer the question yes or no, or whatever as it is asked. No explanations needed, just simple, carefree, and, and so on, yeah? You ready? <clears throat> All right, so who's the best soccer player Zimbabwe has ever produced? Just one. Nyara Didia. Nyara Okay, okay, not bad, not bad. Soldier Love's best song, according to you. <laughs> ah, okay, that's a good one. <laughs> and then uh, farming or mining? I think I know what you say to this one. Farming. Um, I thought, I thought just as much. Uh, Kupe or Munzora? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. And then the last one, uh, Bond or Rand? Bond. Bond. Okay. All right. Well, we 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 will we'll discuss off air why bond over and we'll we'll have that discussion. But for now, though, after such a struggle to get this show going, man, we need we need to. When I see you, we need to just like share a drink because we went through leaps and hoops and bounds to make this episode happen. Not a problem. Just bring a bottle of eighteen and we're good to go. Oh, with, ah, you are a proper politician. You know the brand and the year to drink. No, I, I, I respect you. <laughs> One love. I appreciate you. Thank you very, very much for the, uh, the leader of LEAD political party, the only female president that we have in the country, Linda T. Masarira. And Thank you very much for joining us. Who formed the political party? Left that oh yes, yes, yes. The only woman who formed exactly. We can't. We you are in the history books. Like you are in history, you should be put in the in in in, in the uh, in the curriculum. <laughs> Don't worry. You, I'm going to be there. I am writing a book, as you know. I'm writing a uh -huh. book. So right, I'm right. So all of that will come together. Ah, oh, that's powerful. Thank you very much. We wish you all the best in 2023 and beyond. And hopefully one day we will see you as Zimbabwe's first female president. But for now, though, until then, take care of yourself and love to the family. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Love to your family as well. All right. Lovely guys, that was it, man. I enjoyed that interview. Hope you did too. We will see you next week, same time, same place, just a different date. Bye.